down, shut up, <laughs> and do nothing. So easy. So, so the best thing to do, first of all, is to close your eyes. So you don't have to see anybody at all. Just like going deep inside, inside your body and mind, like coming home. And inside yourself, this body and mind, please be kind. This person called you, or oh, you've lived with her or him for such a long time. So now's the opportunity just to make peace and be kind and be friendly towards yourself. So with your eyes closed, you can imagine looking at yourself in a mirror and smiling. This little being who you've known for such a long time, being through so much together, it's a lot of happiness and fun and laughter, but also a lot of tears and pain. Now's the time to smile and say, I care for you, me. I really do love you. I wish you the very best. I may not be perfect, but I'm good enough. And you can imagine in your meditation all the trees in the forest and the ones which are the most crooked and bent and scarred those ones are the most beautiful trees in the forest. And that's you. Crooked, damaged by life. The most beautiful trees in the forest. So you start the meditation by making peace with yourself and being kind with yourself and appreciating yourself. So just appreciating, appreciating yourself as you are. So this meditation is not to improve, not to improve yourself, but <laughs> not to improve yourself, but to make peace with yourself as you are. So we, we start by making peace with our body, running around all day. How does your body feel? How are your legs? Can you make your legs more comfortable? So ask your legs, hey down there legs, can I make you more comfortable? How are you? Strange thing, if you ask a question, say of your legs, do you need to be moved? Then you get an answer. It is a skillful way of arousing mindfulness of that part of the body. Ask a question. Then you ask your bottom, bottom, do you need to be moved? If you want to fidget, now is the best time to fidget at the beginning of a meditation. Then ask your back, back, how you, do you want to move? And if you want to adjust your back, please again do so. Your hands, you can put your hands wherever you want, but ask them, are they comfortable? This is arousing mindfulness, and the mindfulness, once you're aware of your body. Once you are aware of your body, that's mindfulness. It allows you to have feedback. You understand how your body feels. And you can just put it in a more comfortable position. And then once the, the arms are comfortable, just relax your shoulders. Can you be aware of your shoulders? How are they feeling right now? Are they tight or are they loose? 
See if you can learn how to loosen those shoulders so they're really calm and at ease, comfortable. And lastly, your head. Is it well balanced on top of the neck? You can move it to the left, move it to the right, move it forward, move it back. Make sure it doesn't fall off though. If it does, put it back on until your <laughs> head is as comfortable as you can make it. This is awareness of your posture and moving that posture to make it as comfortable as you possibly can. Mm. <coughs> and once, the, once the posture is adjusted, then just look at your body just as one thing, not as parts. Is your body comfortable now? Now the next part of the meditation is a deeper relaxation. So I'm going to ask you, can you choose one part of your body, just one part, which is uncomfortable or even painful, which is irritating or aching, just one part of your body. And see if you can zoom in on that one part. Focus on it. So just like Google Maps, you can zoom in or Google Earth and everything outside just fades away, falls off the screen. If you focus in on an irritating or painful part of the body. And once you have an awareness of those feelings, you will notice that they change, they get better, they get worse all according to the way your mind looks at it. See if you can experiment with letting that feeling be, being kind to it, embracing it, being with it, all those very gentle, calm ways of looking to an irritating feeling. Your awareness can give you feedback the irritation or pain gets less. Less intense, less painful, less irritating. You can use that with a, a running nose with a cold or with a, an irritating throat which wants to cough or with an ache in the tummy or anywhere. Aware. And then learning how to relax it not by moving, but by using your attitudes of mind. Giving that pain kindness. Giving that irritation letting be. It's like a rubber band which has been stretched tight that's an irritation or pain, stress. And you imagine noticing both ends of that rubber band and loosening the tension, letting it go until the rubber band gets loose, not stretched, not tense, at ease. You've taken the stress off the rubber band at the same time, you use that on your body, taking away the pressure, taking away all the pulling and pushing until that part of the body relaxes to the max. And the pain, the irritation, eases. This combination of mindfulness and kindness what I call kindfulness, can relax any part of the body at will. And your body starts to feel relaxed. No tightness, no tension anywhere. Feels really good. And this helps you 
develop and understand what we call mindfulness and always use it together with kindness or letting things be not controlling but just accepting then you find your body relax very deeply feel, be aware of the body relaxing it's a very very pleasant feeling and once you can recognize that feeling of bodily relaxation you know how to overcome physical stress in your daily life you know how to look at your body with your eyes closed be mindful, be kind and relax everything being aware of any kindness or tension in the body and letting it be if you need to go to sleep at night and you have insomnia this is a wonderful way of overcoming sleeplessness by looking at your body part by part and relaxing it with kindness once the body is relaxed it feels very pleasant my body now hasn't felt as good all day and then I go to another level of relaxation relaxing my mind now you may be relaxed and peaceful you may be tense and agitated so I'm going to ask you don't shout it out loud or say it loud can you please give a number from 1 to 10 on how peaceful you are 1 means really peaceful 10 means very agitated give that a number from 1 to 10 All I'm really doing <coughs> is getting you to be aware of how peaceful you are or how agitated you are. I call that looking or being mindful of the peaceometer, like looking at a speedometer on a car to make sure you don't over go over the limit. You're looking at the peaceometer, how peaceful or how agitated you are inside. Now, see what you need to do to move that peaceometer closer and closer to deep peace. In the same way you relax your body, letting it be, not pushing or pulling your mind, not trying to get somewhere or achieve something, just being where you are you find you get more and more peaceful can you feel that peace grow and deepen when you are mindful of the peaceometer you know how to develop more and more peace inside of you One helpful way is doing a meditative mental exercise. Imagine you have been carrying two heavy shopping bags. You've been down Orchard Road. You're carrying these really heavy shopping bags. So long that your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. imagine looking at this is in your imagination you imagine looking at a shopping bag in your left hand and on the outside are written the letters P A S T pass within that shopping bag are all your memories good and bad what's happened today past week the past year just 
far back as you can remember and you've been carrying those memories for such a long time. They're so heavy, just like those bags would make your arms ache. Just carrying the past makes your mind weak, makes your brain tired. And then you imagine the shopping bag in your right hand. Just like all shopping bags have the name of the department store or the shop where you bought the goods. But this shopping bag has the words F-U-T-U-R-E, future. Because in that bag you keep all of your plans, your worries, your concerns. Your dreams and hopes as well, all in that shopping bag of the right hand. And that too is so heavy. You've been carrying around your plans and anxieties for such a long time without putting them down. But again, your mind is very tired. So imagining those two shopping bags representing your past and your future. You focus on the shopping bag in your left hand to begin with, the past. And you imagine slowly lowering that bag down and down and down until that shopping bag meets the ground. And when it does, you imagine all the weight disappearing so that you can move your left hand away from that shopping bag so that your left arm can hang loosely by your side relaxing, recuperating. You put down the shopping bag of your past. Just put it down for a short while so you can relax and recuperate. And then you imagine the shopping bag in your right hand, your future, fears, anxiety, so heavy. It's made you so tired. So you imagine lowering that down to the ground, slowly, and when it meets the ground, all the weight disappears, which allows you to move your right hand away from the handle of the future. And so your right arm is by your side, resting and relaxing. You've let go of the future. And before you finish this exercise, you imagine those two bags and you're standing on the floor, you're standing in the place between them, in this magic place we call the present. The place of freedom and peace and rest between the past and the future. No one, unfortunately, will take those bags away for you. When the meditation is finished, you can pick them up again. But right now, the period of the meditation, don't pick them up, leave them down there. You've let go of the past. You put down the future. And you deserve to rest in the present. And by taking a rest, just being peaceful in the present, it's an investment. When you come out of the meditation, you'd be more able more strong, more energy to deal with the future and even the past. But right now you need to put those bags down and keep them down. No future, no past. Just now, this moment, just being. Not going anywhere or trying to change anything. Just contemplating what it's like to be no judgment, just being. Being content with this moment, happy to be here. No one is pushing you or judging you or asking you anything. There's no doing, no going. Just be.
have a look at that peaceometer. How peaceful are you? How agitated? See if that needle of that dial, like the meters on your dashboard, see if you can see that meter showing a dial which is going down, down, down to more and more peace. No past, no future, just the present moment. Just being here. Very often, naturally, people start to become aware of their breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. Just like watching the waves on the ocean when you're sitting on the beach. Just very gently, waves coming in, up the beach, and then receding away again. Water coming up and going back. Breath coming in going out, natural, gentle, just gives you something to watch instead of getting lost in all the thoughts, just being with the breath, no need to give anything a name, can you feel the breath, just noticing the breath going in, the breath going out. In the present moment, nothing to do, no past, no future. Keep your hand off those bags. And if you wish, you can imagine saying to yourself with every in breath, breathing in peace, beautiful, relaxing, health giving. Peace. And as you breathe out, breathe out, let go. Letting go of anything which is sickness, ill health, troubles, problems in your life, worries, anything negative. Just allow that to go out with every out breath. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go. Breathing in peace and imagine peace. Whatever you feel peace to be, whether it's peaceful in silence like a forest or a mountain. Imagine peace in your body, health, energy, and peace in your mind. Breathing in peace. Whatever you wish to let go of, maybe sickness, maybe bad memories, whatever you wish to let go of, let it go with every out breath. Breathing in peace. Breathing out, let go. Breathing in energy. Breathing out. Breathing in health, breathing out sickness. But please, whatever you choose, repeat it many times. I'm going to do breathing in peace, breathe out, let go. Breathe, breathe out, let go. Notice your peaceometer. How peaceful are you getting? What does peace feel like? When you know peace, not as a theory, but as an experience, 
we all value it. The most important thing in your life is as you enjoy that peace it will grow and grow and become solid breathing in peace breathe out let go Feel the peace grow. As you let go of all those problems and thoughts, past and future, let it go for this period of time. You don't need to think about it now. You are strengthening your mind and your brain so you can get answers afterwards, but not now. See if you can feel as much stillness as you possibly can. Your mind is like a lake. If there's thoughts on the surface of that lake, the image of the moon and stars cannot be seen. But if the lake is perfectly still, like a mirror, like glass, then a perfect image of the moon and the stars in the heaven above can be seen. When you are still and peaceful, that is when you see things as they truly are. That's where you solve the problems. Breathing in peace, breathe out, let go. imagine your mind your inner world like a gu guitar string if the string of guitar is very tight it makes a high pitched sound as you loosen both ends the guitar string makes a lower pitched noise and so if the guitar string is totally loose it makes no noise at all. The guitar string is like your mind. When it's pulled and stressed and tight, it makes many thoughts. When your mind is loose and relaxed, hardly any thoughts at all. Like a loose guitar string, makes no sound. I will now be silent for five minutes to let you meditate without me guiding you. And after those five minutes, I'll let you know the meditation's over. Be quiet. Don't move for five minutes.
Okay, how do you feel now? How peaceful are you? How relaxed? This is what meditation is like. And if you have a guided meditation, which you can get online, it makes life so much easier. So now please open your eyes and smile for any minute. Don't forget the smile. Remember, I've got to look at you. <laughs> Have compassion for me. <laughs> That's much better, thank you. Okay, very good. So now we can let the doors up open. Yes, to all those latecomers. Very good. Here you can come in. Boom. And the doors are open. Excellent. So please now relax. And if you want to just quickly go to the toilet, keep your seat. And all those who came in late, get the front seats. <laughs> Welcome everybody. You just missed out. Everybody here in the meditation was all enlightened. You'll have to wait to your next lifetime. <laughs> Very good. So please find a place to sit. There's, there's lots of people. Maybe you can squash up a bit in the front here. Can you squash up a bit? Because there's so many other people. It's nice and friendly. Make new friends. <laughs> so you get a nice seat. Now you can start talking now if you want to. I'd always be talking. Find a nice place to find a seat. Very good. Sitting on the floor is very good. You can fit more people on the floor. I often thought of asking Singapore Airlines to take out all the seats and get people to sit on the floor then they can get two levels, get twice as many people in the aircraft as they could sit on the floor. Good business plan. Very good. Yeah, you get closer to the power. <laughs> Very good. If I was something like Brad Pitt or someone famous, you like to get even closer. Very good. So very good. Especially those those people with fat bottoms, they can actually sit on the floor because they don't need cushions. They got their own cushion. <laughs> all fat bottom people. Yes, yeah, you can sit up here if you wish. Okay, uh, could we invite all of you to just really move up uh, right yeah. to the end and squeeze in? They can't see me, they get too far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please when I was up. a school teacher, I always used to know that the teacher's pets would sit in the front, and all the naughty people would sit in the front. And the other thing is that if you do suffer from wind, if you're subject to farting, Please don't sit in the front, otherwise so many people will have to suffer what comes out of your backside. Please make sure you sit in the very, very, very back. That's if you've got indigestion, you pass wind. Is that compassion for people? Yeah. Very good. This is the... Can we just uh, please close the gap there, there and move up. Thank you.
Very good, yes. I always make sure that... And we're going to invite people now to come up to the stage and also take, s take up the space on the stage. Yes. Now there's no one left now. So on the stage as well, you're welcome. There's no one left. They're all here. Anyway, latecomers. Very good. We apologize that uh, we couldn't let you in when the meditation session was going on because there were a lot of people here enjoying the peace and, and silence. And if you were yeah. all coming in, then it would be, be very, very, very distracting. Noisy. So we do apologize that you have to wait outside. Mm -hmm. But I hope you understand. And those of you who didn't have tickets, uh, please, please, for every event, we do have registration. So please book your tickets and have them ready so that it makes sense for people to reserve in advance. Because if we let people in without tickets, then it doesn't make sense for anyone to even register online. So we seek your understanding. The next event, Arjun Brown will be here, will be at the end of the month. It's on 23rd. There are only 250 seats. Wow. And it's <laughs> we couldn't get this venue. We couldn't get many other venues. So that was the best that we could come up with at Rinse Multipurpose Hall at the uh, hospital itself. So the registration will open tomorrow, not today. <laughs> and you will see it on the Facebook posting. Depends on what time I wake up. <laughs> but it will be tomorrow. And, and if you don't uh, know about Ajahn Brahm's retreat yet, uh, please do take a flyer that's from the table or go to the Bodhiana Singapore page on Facebook. It's available there. The Ajahn Brahm's retreat will be in Phuket this year, and mm. it's going to start on the 27th of May. You have a choice of the short retreat and the long retreat. And it's usually special with all of my retreats. I know it sometimes costs a lot of money, but we always give the possibility of asking for a refund. If you're not happy with the retreat, you can always ask for your money back. <laughs> you will never get it back, me. but you can allow to ask. Ask from Ajahn Brahm, he won't have any money. <laughs> yes, so I can't give it to you, but you're allowed to ask. It's free to ask. You always say no, but free to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and since I have your attention, I'd like to uh, just highlight to you that there is a mental well-being seminar that will be held at the DBS uh, Financial Center. So this Ooh. is a secular charity that's got Ajahn Brahm's name on it, and there will be two speakers, Dr. Chan Tin Lung, who will be speaking on depression and dementia. So please do come for the talk to find out more about depression and dementia because you can actually end up helping someone who may be suffering from one of the two. And although dementia due to Alzheimer's may not be treatable, there are two different kinds of dementia that are treatable. So be educated on that. And Dr. Peter Mack will be talking about building mental resilience. Buddhist Fellowship has organized a Taiwan uh, tour to uh, a few uh, famous uh, Taiwanese-based monasteries. So if you're interested in June, uh, maybe you can look at the website or if you have a chance to get the flyer as well. Okay. Looks like you're all ready for the talk, right? Should we start early? Yeah. Like. 10 minutes early. Then they got more of you. This is Singapore. Singapore Airlines never leaves early. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> on time. Sometimes ahead of schedule if all the passengers are on board. Okay, uh, will the passengers who are just arriving please board up on stage? First class. <laughs> First class, up stage. You're being upgraded. <laughs> Compliments of Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> so please go ahead and, oh, don't fall. Very good. Uh, please go wow. to the other side so that uh, the latecomers can fill up on this side. So for those of you who are still not uh, entirely sure on how to meditate, you can come to uh, Brahm Center to learn mindfulness. And, they, and we actually teach uh, breathing techniques, loving-kindness techniques, um, mindful movement, mindful walking, 
And we also invite you to join the Mindful Walk that will be on this Sunday. All the information is on, on this flyer. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, there is a new book launch today called The Perfectly Contented Book by Arjun Brahm. And if you're a cat lover, perfect book for you. If you're not a cat lover, you will love cats after you read this book. <laughs> and uh, all-time favorites, Open Your Door of Your Heart, uh, Two Bad Breaks are all available. We do have some aprons as well to inspire you, especially when you're cooking. And when you're not cooking, you can wear it to do uh, housework. The proceeds go to uh, the monastery. And we have a few CDs left by Dr. John kabat -Zinn on Wherever You Are, There You Are. It's an excellent uh, Dhamma talk set of CDs of three, or four actually, that you can use it in your car. So those of you who drive, at least you're listening to something very inspiring. Okay, so I think uh, we're all ready to start. So I'd like to uh, introduce Ajahn Brahm to those who don't know Ajahn Brahm. There he is. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and why he's so popular, those of you who are here for the first time, is because Ajahn Brahm's uh, way of teaching the Dhamma is fresh, it's um, unconventional, uh, and he tells jokes, plus uh, he says bad what's... Bad jokes, bad jokes. Bad not, jokes, not good ones, yeah. but people still laugh, so they keep coming back. <laughs> and he also uses words like S H I T. You, so, mean, uh, you, mean, <laughs> you mean shit? What yeah. word? Come on. <laughs> Come on, Angie, say it. Shit. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's bad influence. Okay, so uh, please welcome Ajahn Brown, who's going to be speaking on the topic when you don't get what you want in life. So please welcome Ajahn Brahm. Very good. I did not want to give a talk tonight, but I got what I don't want. <laughs> the whole of your life is getting what you don't want, but when things go wrong, that's when they get really interesting. So the more things which go wrong in my life, the more fun that I have. And I've noticed when I make mistakes and things go wrong, that is the very, very best part of my life. I think, I'm not sure if I told this story the last time I was here a month or two ago. If I did, then I'll have to attend that talk on depression and dementia, because I probably am suffering it for myself. But this was uh, when I was teaching a meditation retreat in Penang. And, I'm oh sorry, Kuala Lumpur. And a couple of people came in to actually speak to me for interviews. And it was uh, a young woman and a young man I thought she was about you know, 21, 22 years of age. And they wanted to talk about some things in their life and meditation. At the end of the five or ten minutes of talking to me, sort of, uh, the girl did all the talking. And I asked the girl, sort of, you know, is, who's that fellow sitting next to you? You know, is that your boyfriend? And she laughed and said, no, that's not my boyfriend. That's my father. <laughs> So I made big mistakes, because I thought she was about 21, 22. She said she was only 16. But even though I made a mistake and my assessment went wrong, she was so happy that a 16-year-old girl was like looked upon as being mature, 21, 22. She may be able to get into nightclubs and other places she's not supposed to go into. So she was very, very flattered, but not as flattered as her father was. You mean I look young enough to be his, her boyfriend? And even though it was a big mistake, they were so happy with me, they went outside and five minutes later they came in with a $150 donation. <laughs> That's why making mistakes is very profitable. 
But on the donation envelope, they did write that this is to sponsor Ajahn Brahm going to the optometrist and getting his glasses checked. <laughs> but things do go wrong. You, or do they go wrong? All of this idea of things going wrong, I always say they don't go wrong in life, they go interesting. Because we always think that life shouldn't go interesting. It should all go according to plan. But I know in my life it hasn't gone according to plan. I became a monk, a Buddhist monk to leave the world. Now look at me, sitting up here in front of a couple of hundred, how many people here tonight? Any idea? How many people are supposed to be here? 700 people. I never thought I'd become a monk like that. If I wanted to have been in front of 700 people, I'd have become a rock star. I got a guitar and started singing. But how, and it's absolutely true. If you want to come for that uh, talk in a couple of weeks' time, you have to book early. Because this one time I was teaching in a Medan in, Malaysia, in uh, Indonesia, and they had to sell tickets only for like, you know, like a 50 cents each, just to be able to limit the crowd, not to make any money. But uh, my tickets sold out in, what was it, about one hour or two hours when it went online. At the same time, Lady Gaga was performing in Jakarta. Her tickets took about eight hours to sell. <laughs> so it's very clear that I'm much more popular than Lady Gaga. <laughs> what on earth is happening in my life? This is totally not going according to plan. I just wanted to be a nice, simple monk. Spend all my time meditating. And that's probably what I like to do. I like to tell bad jokes. The reason I tell bad jokes, you may not know this, is I tell bad jokes on purpose. The reason is I want to offend people and upset people so much they can't stand my bad jokes anymore. They all go home. So I don't need to give any talks anymore. I can have a nice, peaceful, easy life. But what happens? I tell one bad joke and they ask for another one. <laughs> so I told this joke to somebody recently. You've heard it in Perth. Because it's very topical. Donald Trump. <laughs> now that's not the joke. I haven't told the joke yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if any of you heard the news an assassination attempt against Donald Trump. You haven't heard that news? This in one of his meetings, someone pulled a gun and pointed the gun at Donald Trump. And one of his bodyguards shouted out, Donald, duck! <laughs> <laughs> and at that, the gunman burst out laughing so they could arrest him. <laughs> That's a stupid joke. I don't want you to laugh, I want you to boo so I don't have to come back again. But anyway, <laughs> life never goes according to plan. So one of my little sayings, and I actually live by this, I said instead of planning things, try not to plan and just see what happens. Because I have noticed, I have noticed if I don't plan what I'm going to do, you know, things will usually go wrong. I miss appointments, miss flights, or whatever. If you don't plan, things go wrong. If you do plan, they go wrong anyway. <laughs> Either way it goes wrong, so why not enjoy it before it goes wrong? That's, <laughs> that's the meaning of <laughs> my life. Don't plan so much. The more you plan, the more chance there is that things go wrong which means not according to my plan. And the more you plan, the more you're going to have problems in life, the more things are going to go wrong, and you get frustrated. Why? Because it does not go according to plan. Nothing ever does. So, I encourage you to live like me. Just see what happens. 
It doesn't matter how things turn out. There's always something you can do with it. This is just a basic, this is a bit of Buddhism now. Actually, I'm a Buddhist monk, so I suppose I should talk some Buddhism every now and again. <laughs> this is a law of karma. Right? Karma gives you the ingredients which you have to work with in life. But the most important part is what you do with what happens to you. How you make it work. And the usual simile, which is you can actually remember, there's two people baking a cake. And the first person has the very worst ingredients. They've got white flour. White flour which has been so refined and processed there's hardly any, anything left, just chemicals. And the white flour has been in the, the kitchen for such a long time, it's gone moldy. They have to pick out the green bits of the chemically enhanced white flour, first of all. And instead of something nice, they've got cholesterol-enhanced margarine. <laughs> uh, diabetically amplified sugar. <laughs> and they've got fruit, fruit which is so hard, the Singapore military could use it as bullets to fight their enemies the very worst ingredients they have to bake their cake. And the second person has got the very best ingredients to bake a cake with. They have organically grown whole wheat, full grain flour from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> the very best, without any genetically modified crops within a thousand miles. And they have this, uh, what's it, that canola oil. It's supposed to be cholesterol free. And they've got beautiful honey. And lastly, they've got beautiful fruit from the gardens of Singapore. Fresh, the very best ingredients. Now the two people, one with the worst ingredients, one with the best ingredients, who bakes the best cake? I read an article that uh, I made up this story years ago. But there was one of these celebrity, celebrity chefs. I forget who it was, Jamie Oliver or something. And they gave him a, a test, a competition, to go in Singapore to one of the hawker stalls and just same uh, to, for him to cook something up in competition with the, the street hawkers here in Singapore. And they asked members of the general public who makes the most delicious, like um, dumplings or whatever. And the hawkers won easily. They actually were better chefs than these celebrity chefs you see on TV, like Jamie Oliver. And the reason is because they don't have the best ingredients or these amazing kitchens, but they certainly know how to put lots of effort love and skill into what they have. So, the law of karma is your past gives you the ingredients you have to work with. You say things go wrong. I say those are the ingredients you have. But what are you doing with it? Because that's the karma of the present. What you're doing with those bad ingredients and you know, many times I've seen this, that people with the worst ingredients in life, they make the best cakes, the most delicious. And those privileged people, children of wealthy, rich people, they are so talented, so beautiful, they can do anything, but they end up wasting the ingredients of their lives, getting into drugs, wasting their life, as people like to say, like, I'm not sure what she's doing now, Paris Hilton. So wealthy, so beautiful, wasting her life getting involved in drugs. Great ingredients, but she didn't know how to make use of that good karma. As for me, I'm fat, I'm old, but I get more photographs taken of me than Paris Hilton. <laughs> so I must be doing something right. <laughs>
<laughs> but, so it's what you make of what you have. So don't ever think that things have gone wrong and start becoming a victim and start thinking terrible and why me? I always say, amazing. This is an opportunity. This is extra stuff which you can use. My, one of my, uh, okay, Ajahn, uh, not Ajahn, Angie, she was mentioning that I use the shit word, so here it comes again, one of my great stories. When things don't go the way you want, it is like you go home after the talk. And when you go home, you find that somebody has dumped a whole truckload of shit right in front of the door of your apartment. This is only a simile, okay? <laughs> and what do you do with that? You think, oh, it's all gone wrong. Who did this? Now, there's two things you should know when things go wrong in your life. Number one, you never deserved it. You never ordered that truckload of dung. And number two, you can't ring up somebody to get it to be taken away. You're stuck with it. It's there. You have to, you can't, you can complain. Why me? Why me? Why me? I don't deserve this. I never did this. Why me? And you can't tell someone or ask someone to take it away. I know this is Chinese New Year and you like to come up to me and say, can you chant for me to get rid of this and get rid of that? Get rid of my bad luck. Get rid of my sort of an ability to get a job, get rid of my husband, get rid of my <laughs> pets. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't do that. My powers only go so far. <laughs> but instead of trying to get rid of these things, like the difficulties in your life, no, we learn how to make use of the difficulties. So what happens is if you do get a truckload of shit in front of your apartment, you get out the wheelbarrow and the spade and you put it in the wheelbarrow, you take it round the back to the nearest garden and you dig it in the garden. You dig it in and dig it in and dig it in because shit is one of the best fertilizers. And after a year or two years, all the shit of your life, and for many of you, it's a huge amount, It all gets dug into your garden. And for those of you who like durians, if your durian has been really well fertilized with the shit of your life, then you will find that your durians are more smelly than ever. <laughs> I don't mean that. I mean more delicious than ever. And juicy. Much better than you can get in the shops down in Galang. You will find that you've got the very, very best. Sweet, juicy. But I always tell people, when you, you're eating that juicy durian, and sometimes so juicy, it drips down your cheek. You must always remember what you're eating. What are you eating? Shit, that's what you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really important. All the difficulties and problems of your life if you know how to make use of, you will find that they enhance your life. That you become a more compassionate, wise, peaceful, happy person because of what you've been through. So for me, when anything goes wrong in life, more shit for my compassion and my wisdom. And my goodness, in my job, I do need a lot of shit because I've got to try and come up with new stories every time I come here. <laughs> so I need more difficulties in life, more problems. So never think that things go wrong. They don't go wrong in life. Even simple things. And I hope you're practicing this. I've been teaching this for years. I know there's a few doctors here see one looking at me right now. Hopefully that people take me seriously. How many people in this auditorium have never been sick in their life? 
Can you put your hand up, please? Be honest, if you never had a day of sickness. Now, no one is putting their hand up, which means that every one of you have been sick from time to time. Now, imagine, imagine you did put your hand up. You've never been sick before in your life. You would be weird. You would be a, medi a medical anomaly. You would be invited to the university to have experiments done on you. You'd become like a guinea pig, like a laboratory rat. What is with this person? They've never been sick. There'll be something very unusual in you. So unusual, there's something wrong with you. That you never get sick. So when I started thinking like that, I realized it's normal to be sick. It's usual to be sick. In fact, actually, they're laughing more than me. I've got competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I, now they're wondering what I do. <laughs> so anyway, it's normal to be sick. It's usual to be sick. So why do people say there's something wrong with me? I'm sick. There's nothing wrong with being sick. It's normal. It's usual. It's common. So next time you go and see your doctor, never say, doctor, there's something wrong with me. I'm sick. You must say, doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. Now that is wisdom. <coughs> you know, I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm supposed to be healthy. So there's one time I recall I had to go to the doctor. I was feeling poorly, sick of dinner, what it was. And I was sitting in the doctor's surgery, feeling terrible, really sick. And then one of my disciples came in, one of the people I've been teaching meditation to for years. When he came in, he looked at me and said, Ajahn Brahm, I never expected to see you in a place like this. I thought I was in a brothel or in a pub or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I felt like. There's only the doctors. I get sick too. He made me feel guilty that I should know better. <laughs> better lifestyle. No, everybody gets sick. It's normal, so please take away the stigma of physical sickness. What about mental sickness? Everyone, this is according to the Dhamma of Buddhism. Is anyone here fully enlightened? <laughs> if you are not fully enlightened, you are mentally sick, <laughs> according to the Buddha. <laughs> so, you're all mentally sick in this place. Some are extremely mentally sick. Some are just normal mental sickness. <laughs> you must be mentally sick. I mean, people are so mentally sick, they go home and watch the TV. Dummy stuff. I sometimes go past Singapore Airport and I see what's on the TV there. It's dummy stuff. It's like reality TV. You know, who would ever watch something like that? That's why when people told me that Donald Trump became prime minister, uh, president, I thought that was a reality TV show. <laughs> you know, what would happen if? Only apparently it was real. Oh, is it real? I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, people are mentally sick. We're sick, we get angry. What do you get angry for? That's real mental sickness. Somebody calls you a dog. What's wrong with being called a dog? I quite admire dogs. I respect them. They're much wiser than most people. You know why? Because dogs never have to go to work. <laughs> they live in your houses, really relaxing and resting while you have to go to work, stressed out, you know, having a difficult time, get stuck in the traffic. Dogs don't have to go to work in the traffic on a Monday morning and get stuck there and stay there till late at night and worry about their finances. Are you worried about your finances? 
Dogs never are. They always get a good meal and a nice place to stay. So one of my friends said he wanted to be reborn as a dog in his next life. So I said, why do you want to do that for? He said, look, I don't have to get up early in the morning, sleep all day, eat good food. All I need to do is you know, to get taken out for a walk, lick my, my boss, that's all I have to do, but many of you have to do that at work, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> And then I have a nice life, no stress, eat really good food. I see some of the food that dogs eat. You know, they <laughs> you know, next, next to our city center in Nolamara, there's a cat, you know, the caretaker, Lynn. She's got a cat there. She feeds the cat Angus beef every day. Not cat food. This cat looks like cat food, no way. So the very, very, very best, really expensive food. And does the cat have to go to work for that? No. It just sleeps all day and gets up when the Angus beef comes in its little plate. Beautiful, full cream milk. The cat doesn't worry about cholesterol or diabetes. <laughs> Not like you people do. <laughs> so the dogs and the cats live a very, very happy life. So who's the crazy one? <laughs> so, everybody's got mental illness. Actually, why do you strive so hard? You know, sometimes people ask me about, should I go for the promo promotion? So, what are, you, what are you going for the promotion for? Haven't you got enough stress already in the job you're doing? Because I don't think like that. I said, but we get more money. But it doesn't matter how much money you earn, however much it is, it's never enough. So you get a promotion, it's more money, but still not enough. You become the CEO, still more money, but not enough. Even Bill Gates, he still has to go to work, so he hasn't got enough yet. The only person here who's already got enough is me, who's got nothing. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> So I'm like, a, like the little dog, that's you know, one of my mentors there. Because you know, people come and feed me every day. They're really nice, they took me to a nice restaurant today. So I'm just like the dog, and all I have to do is just you know, be nice and wag my tail. <laughs> <laughs> it's important, you know, the <laughs> on a, people wonder about monks, about you know, how much does it cost to look after a monk? Or a nun for that matter. Because when our first monks went to UK, the, the organization called the English Sangha Trust at the time, they were wondering whether they had enough funds coming in to look after a group of monks. So the, one of their members, who became the president of the English Sangha Trust, a man called Colin Ash. I think he came to the first global conference which we had here. And he was an economist, a professor teaching in Reading University and advisor to the Bank of England. So quite a senior economist. So he decided he's going to work out how much it costs to look after a monk, to see where they could afford it. So he did the math and he found out, he discovered, it is actually cheaper, much less expensive to look after a, 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 a monk than it is to look after a dog. We're far cheaper. So after that, he told everybody, every home should have one. <laughs> <laughs> he may, instead of having a pet dog, have a pet, pet monk or pet nun. <laughs> you know, they're much better than a dog. You know, they're kind and they're just always, you know, just, they never argue at you or get angry at you. Just the dogs never bark at you. They just look at you with his big eyes like a monk. And you feed them, that's all they need to be happy. <laughs> And just like, just like dogs, monks eat out of bowls and they live in a little house in the back garden. <laughs> in the monastery we call it Kuti. In the house it's called Kennel. Same thing really. <laughs> you take us for a walk and everybody, we always give you nice advice. Always lots of kindness and love. So there's a lot of similarities there. <laughs> but it doesn't cost that much. But <laughs> anyway, so 
to me that things never go wrong and you're not wrong if you're sort of even mentally actually that I wrote this on somebody's book they asked me to, to do a little quote and it said there's no one with mental illness there's no sorry no mentally ill people in Singapore all there is is people who sometimes have episodes of mental illness sometimes we all get a bit stressed out we get angry, really sort of weird and strange. Sometimes we always forget things. Sometimes we always forget things. Sometimes we always forget things. <laughs> we always have, have those times we just act really weirdly. But there's nothing wrong with that. Instead, we always say that this is part of life. It's, it's okay to forget things from time to time. It's okay to sort of, you know, to oh, be a bit stupid from time to time. So why do we call that mental illness? Or say it's wrong? So it would be wonderful if we destigmatize illnesses physical and mental illness and stop saying it's wrong but to say it's part of life and why do we say it's wrong that sometimes people have been through very difficult childhood, childhoods or even difficult marriages and be traumatized is that wrong I once gave a talk at the uh, had a mental health seminar in Perth. And these were of the victims of mental health. And I had them all crying and weeping. So just for a simple story, which I often tell on retreats, a story, I did mention it in passing in the meditation, the story of the forest. Because I asked all these people who had been through depressions, who've been through um, many, many psychoses, who've been abused, who uh, had huge amounts of so-called problems which they went to, to therapists for. And I said that if you ever go in the forest and you go for a walk by yourself, always go and look for the most beautiful tree. And if you find the most beautiful tree, it will always be one which is crooked, which is bent and damaged. We've got many marks on the bark of that tree, damaged from the storms of life in a forest. And, it is, and many branches have been ripped off by those storms. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that where those branches have fallen off the trees, the holes left are where the birds will nest. And so I've looked for those trees and I've always understood it is the damaged trees, the crooked and bent ones, which are the most beautiful. They're the ones which I admire the most. If it's a straight tree, I just walk past it. It's normal, ordinary. But the bent and crooked trees, to me, they're always the most beautiful. So I told this gathering of people who had been told they were damaged goods because they had a terrible childhood and things went terribly wrong for them. I told those people who had suffered the trauma of a devastating loss in their life, that maybe one of their partner or a child was murdered. I tell them that you are damaged trees. You, number one, belong. You're part of humanity. You're welcome in the forest. And number two, you are most likely to be the most beautiful trees in the forest. The ones which are the most crooked, damaged, bent, and scarred. The most beautiful trees. Check it out. You find the most beautiful tree in the forest, and you'll find how true what I say is. So sometimes, is it really something that's gone wrong? Or is it sometimes those experiences of life 
have made us more beautiful, more inspiring. But certainly, you belong. Never ever feel excluded by life because you've had some difficulties. You belong. So when we feel excluded, there's something wrong with us, that we don't fit in somehow, and that's very true in Singapore. There's many people who feel isolated, who feel rejected, who feel they don't belong in this beautiful forest of Singaporeans. Have a look in a real forest and realize, yes, you are part of things. You do belong. Nothing has gone wrong. There's been an opportunity there which you've missed and haven't grown from. So now, start growing. But first of all, we take off the idea, it is wrong. I know sometimes people always think that everything has gone wrong. It is not true that everything has gone wrong. People come and say that my whole life is going wrong. And they say, no, it hasn't. How's your toes? Your toes are okay. <laughs> but people exaggerate so much. We just focus on the faults. We become what we call in Buddhism fault finders. Always looking at what's wrong in life. Your husband. <laughs> Why do you always look at his faults? If he is a perfect husband, straight, undamaged, with all the branches in place, he's not beautiful. Remember, the crooked ones are the most beautiful. So if you've got a crooked husband, he's the most beautiful man in the whole forest. <laughs> Just like the crooked trees. If you've got a drop-dead gorgeous wife or partner. So, that's not beauty. The scars and the bent, the damage of life, that makes people beautiful. Does it? Their characters. Their characters are something which really grows, has the opportunity to grow. If they've been through difficult times, learn from it and become really kind people. If you've ever been with people who've really had a lot of difficulty in their life and grown from it, they're incredibly compassionate. It's amazing the wisdom which they have and the kindness reason is because they know what it's like to hurt very deeply. They've known, they felt that. And so they can never go past anybody else who's hurting. If you don't know what it feels like to be really rejected, alone, to be treatin treated like you're a piece of shit by other people, if you don't know what that feels like, then when you pass another person who's feeling just like that, then you will never, you will never be able to really help them. This anecdote story, again, happened, hap it happened in Kuala Lumpur many years ago. It's one of my most moving stories. When I say this, I have to, I do, I do get emotional about it because the power of what happened. Because there are counsellors and therapists. I've never been trained as a counsellor or a therapist. I've been trained as a monk and now I teach counsellors and therapists without any training. My qualification is these robes. But it seems to work. Because this lady came in to see me. And she wasn't really part of the group I was teaching, but they said, can you please, please, please give her a few minutes because no one else has been able to help her. So I sat in a room with her, making my mind very peaceful so I could listen to her. It's really important if you're talking to someone and trying to help them through some of the troubles of life, just be very quiet inside. Don't think what she's saying or he's saying. Don't, as they say, second guess. But just be still to see if you can find out what she's really saying. So she told me, she was maybe about 40, 45 year old woman. She told me this terrible, terrible story of how she'd been very violently and brutally assaulted, raped. A terrible thing to hear. And to this day, I don't know why some people do those things to one another. 
was just unbelievable. But anyway, she'd gone through this terrible, terrible, terrible experience. And once she finished her story, because I was really quiet and peaceful, what I said shocked me. It was automatic, not premeditated. It came from silence. And whenever I got that book, Wisdom from Silence, uh, I really mean that. The best wisdom comes from a silent mind. If I'd have thought, I could not have said this. After she finished recounting this disgusting experience, I said, the words came out of my mind, mouth, you are so lucky to have been raped like that. That's what I said. And that just shocked me. You know, I didn't think about that. It just came out. And she was shocked. And her eyes went wide, her mouth drooped. What the heck does this monk mean? And that's what I thought too. <laughs> but then, sort of having said that, from that silence, I understood why I'd said that. Because one of the terrible things being through such a trauma is trying to find some meaning, some purpose to it. It seems to be totally meaningless and purposeless. I said that I will never be able to understand how you feel. Number one, I'm a man, and I've never been through that experience. I never will do in my life. But I said, there's something I've seen in you, and I've been just listening to you in silence. Something very deep. Your strength, your ability. I said, you're going to find your way through this. I don't know how, I can't really help that. But actually, I did. But I said that once you've got through this terrible experience, that's when you'll find its meaning and purpose. Because you'll be able to do something I will never do, never be able to do. You'll be able to be with other women who have been treated similarly, maybe worse, probably less worse, because what you went through was, was extreme. You'll be able to be, be with that person and look at them in the eye and say, I know, I know how you feel. I've been there in that terrible, terrible dark hole. But more importantly, I know the way out. Take my hand. I will bring you out like I came out. You'll be able to help and serve people I will never be able to serve, to touch people like I can never do. That is your job now. And she understood. It gave her something to do, to hope for, a purpose and meaning for her life after that meeting. Something she could do, rather than always looking back at the pain. And the, <coughs> what's the word? It's just the, the stupidity, the hopeless, the uselessness, the why of that experience. She turned it into a, a great positive become a, one of the most amazing counsellors because she had been in that hole herself. And when I said that, it was amazing, the result. At last, she had an answer, something she could do, something to put it in perspective, something terribly wrong which had happened, turned it into something which could be useful. Take away the wrong wrongness of it. Deep shit make it into the most incredible uh, mangoes or durians. So that is when things happen to you in life, really wrong. That was an extreme case. Maybe it's not happened to you. Maybe it's not so bad, but never call it so-called wrong. It's happened. That person who did that, you don't need to be the person who, who so-called gets justice. For many people, justice is just revenge. They hurt me, I'm going to hurt them back. So justice, I always tell people, if you're a, a Buddhist, karma, karma, will, please excuse me, but karma will get the bastard anyway. <laughs> that makes it more powerful when I make, say that word. Hindu again, karma will get them. If you're a Christian or a Muslim, God will get them. And if you don't believe in any religion, if you're an atheist, then it doesn't matter what they did. 
they'd be psychologically damaged by what they did for a long time. They'll never have any happiness. You know that. I've seen that so many times. But the point is, when you want revenge, you just make the whole thing much, much worse. Instead of digging it in and growing from the experiences which have had in life. So I know so many stories like that. You get Nelson Mandela, 16 years, no, 26 years in jail. When he was uh, released from jail, he didn't think of revenge, and he had the power to get revenge. He had the power, because you know, he was president. He never did that. He had amnesty, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was one of the most Buddhist things I've ever seen done on a political level. Tell the truth, and you'll be given amnesty. Because we want to learn from what happened. And that is so Buddhist, because how I was taught, when you make a mistake, when something goes wrong, no punishment, but learn from it. Make sure that never, ever happens again. It's learning, not punishment. If it's punishment, I said this just a couple of days ago in Sri Lanka. Actually, just last night. In, if it's punishment, what happens? People are afraid of telling the truth. Which means people lie. Something which I've, I'm going off subject, but in relationships, in your partnerships, do you always tell the truth to your wife? Always tell the truth to your husband? Do the children tell the truth to their parents? If not, why not? Because they're scared to tell the truth. This happened when a Sri Lankan girl, 19, comes to my temple every week, came to see me. She said, Ajahn Brahm, I need your help. So that's what I'm here for, just like the family dog. <laughs> give you a lick, give you some good advice. And I said, what's the problem? And she said she was pregnant. She fell pregnant with her boyfriend. And I said, have you told your mother and father yet? She said, no, that's the trouble. They'll kill me. That's what I came to you for. Can you please tell them for me? <laughs> <laughs> that's my job too. <laughs> so I told the parents. No, it happens. People make mistakes in life. We don't plan that, but it happens. So I said to, to the, you know, I, I, I consoled the parents and told her, you know, give your kid a break. You know, she's so upset about what happened and she doesn't need punishment. She needs your help to get her through this difficult time as a young lady. But what really struck me was why is it that kids are afraid to tell their parents when they really need their help the most? Because my father would kill me if he found out I was taking drugs. So I don't tell you. My husband would kill me if he found out what I was up to. My wife, oh, she found out I'd be in big trouble. So one of the things I've been advising people, please, if you've got a partnership, husband, wife, couple, gay, I don't care, but everyone is allowed, encouraged, respected in Buddhist teachings. For goodness sake, please make a, a decision between the two of you that you'll always tell the truth to one another and as long as you tell the truth, you'll never be scolded or punished. If you lie, yes, okay, fair enough. Scold, shout, whatever you do. But as long as you tell the truth, never scold, never punish. Because, darling, I want you to feel that when you are in trouble, you can tell me. I don't want you to lie and hide it. When you need me the most, that's when I'm here. I don't want you to feel afraid. And tell that to your children too, please. Because the times when they really do get in big trouble, that's the time they're most scared. Just like that person a long time ago, he was accused of murder in New York. He was having his trial at a time when if he was convicted and found guilty, he'd face the electric chair. 
It was a capital punishment in those days, murder in, in New York. And the judge interrupted his testimony, he said to the person standing trial for murder, no, it looks like you're lying, sir. I want to remind you that the penalties for perjury, lying under oath, are very serious in this state. And the defendant said, yes, I realize that, but the penalties for telling the truth are much worse than perjury. <laughs> in other words, he had killed that person. So to tell the truth would mean he would be killed. Perjury would just go to jail for a few years. That's why people lie. So one of the things which I'd love to do is to try, and especially in a family, to encourage honesty by getting rid of the punishment. So a kid tells you the truth, they're not afraid. Your wife, your husband tells you the truth, they're not afraid. Because it is not wrong to make a mistake. We all make mistakes, but I was always taught, and I encourage this, we don't get punished for mistakes, we learn from them to be better next time. So your children say they made a mistake, okay, I'm gonna help you to make sure that we do better next time. You don't fall pregnant next time. You know, you're a woman, you can say no, take control of your sexuality. You know, go out with good boys or whatever. Don't get yourself in that situation where that might happen taking drugs, associate with some good people. Why do you take the drugs anyway? Now do some research first of all. What happens if you take those drugs? Now be smart. Don't just follow your peers. If you, you're know, following you know, some of your friends, we'll get some better friends for you. If it's your boy, get him a nice girlfriend. Even pay her, you know, just to, you know, to get him off that so he's got a nice girl who can actually, because sometimes I've noticed this, your sons will not listen to you, but they certainly listen to a girlfriend. I call that girlfriend power. It's true, this is a story of how it works. There was this, uh, he was a Malaysian man living in Perth. His son was always going out with his girlfriend late at night, parties, nightclubs. He didn't mind that, he was a young man, he could enjoy himself, but he wasn't doing his homework at university and his grades were going down, down, down. He's getting in trouble, maybe get kicked out of university. So he would tell him, look, do more work, get your homework finished first, then you can go out. But he never listened to his father nor his mother. But his father was very smart. So his father waited for him to come home with his girlfriend late at night. He was waiting outside in the car park when the car drove up and the son was terrified. What's my father up to? He's waiting for us. And he was very polite, very kind. He asked the, the girlfriend of him, please come inside the house. He never talked to his son, just to his girlfriend. He said, look, I don't know how long you've been going out together and how, actually how, how far your relationship is, but you've been going out for quite a while now. And I don't know, it may work out that you go to the next step and who knows, maybe even get engaged. But if you do marry someone, to this girl, I'm sure you don't want to marry someone who's a dummy, who never actually passes university, never gets a degree. But no, of course not. I don't want to marry sort of a guy who's got a nice degree and good education, can get a good job. But I just wanted to let you know that your boyfriend's, my son's grades are going down, down, down. And he's going to be very close to being kicked out of university. Good night, have a wonderful evening together. <laughs> <coughs> and that's all he needed to do. As soon as he got out of the room, the girlfriend, you never told me that your grades were going down. I don't want to go out with you if you're a dummy, get kicked out of university. You do your, your homework. You get your assignments in, in time. She was on his case every day since that time. And that poor boy, he could resist what his mother and father said, but his girlfriend had full power over him. So always remember that. And if you've got a kid, especially a son, and he doesn't listen to his parents, get a nice girlfriend. Just, you know, just uh, get some deal, some arrangement with her. And then you've got full power then. It's called leverage. <laughs> Everyone's got some weak point, so get their leverage and then you'll be fine. But the point is, we all make mistakes sometimes, but please don't 
think that making a mistake is wrong. Otherwise, be hard on mistakes. I never did that. It wasn't me. I never did that. Somebody else, when it was you. Don't admit your mistakes. I love making mistakes. You know, because I mentioned one mistake. I know that uh, uh, Angie was really on at me about sort of not doing too much chanting for people because every time I come to Singapore, there's always somebody sick. And say, can you please come and chant from this person, that person? And oh, there's so many people. How many people are there in Singapore in the hospital? I can't chant for all of them. I thought that maybe what you might do is get all the sick people who are members of the Bodhinyana or Buddhist fellowship to all come together in the hospital. And I, they can all actually come in one room, but I chant for all of them, get it out and over and done with, and I can go back again. <laughs> no, there's, there's too many people who are sick, but it's also sometimes I do the wrong chanting. You know that story, I think I told it last time. I went to this Chinese man, he was dying in the ICU. ICU, he's in a coma. And the family wanted me to do some chanting for their father. So I went into the ICU, chanted really hard, really gave everything I've got, full power, zap, zap, zap. <laughs> and it worked. He got better. At least I thought it worked. You know, he came out of the coma. And he got better. And about a few days later, that's when the family came to see me, really angry. So upset at me. So why? Your father's got better. Yes, he wasn't supposed to. We, we asked you to chant for a peaceful death. <laughs> Not that you get better. We'd all come from Singapore and Hong Kong, all come from our father's death. The doctor said there was no hope. And we'd arranged the funeral. Everything was all arranged. Now we had to cancel this and all go home. We have to come back later on when he dies properly because of you, Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> I was in big trouble for that. Because I did the wrong chanting. I made a big mistake. So it wasn't really wrong. It just, no, I made a mistake and I learned from it. I learned. Because now when I go to hospital to, to do some chanting, I asked, what chanting do you want? <laughs> <laughs> For your grandma to get better or your grandma to die? Please tell me first of all, <laughs> otherwise I might get it wrong. <laughs> so I make mistakes, but this is what you learn from it. So it's not things go wrong. So don't get frustrated. Expect mistakes. They will happen. And if you don't make mistakes, it means you're not learning. You're not pushing your boundaries. You're not growing in life. And if you're afraid to make mistakes, you never make any progress at all and you're so upset. Look, even young guys. I learned this when I was a young guy. You see a nice girl, as a y not as a monk, when I was a young, young man, and you go up to talk to her and sometimes you say the wrong thing, sometimes she doesn't like you. But you n if you're afraid of making mistakes, you never make any progress at all. And then you make the nice ones you can go out with. But even if you find a nice partner, like what happened to me, I was going out with her for about six months and then she dumped me. Was that wrong? I tell her to this day, that was the most wonderful thing she ever did for me, to dump me. Otherwise, I'd never become a monk. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so there's no such things as mistakes in life. Or actually doing things wrong. This is all our journey of life, a series of unexpected events. And when you get to the end of your life, you look back upon your life and you will say, you know, what is really wrong things happened in my life? You say, no, no, there's just unexpected, strange journeys in life. And you never really knew what was going to happen or why it happened. But in the end, I hopefully, like you, you'd realize it was worth it. A wonderful journey of unexpected twists and turns. And it wasn't that things went wrong. I never really worried about getting frustrated. I let life just go its way. And I went along for the journey. And what an amazing, interesting journey that was. It had many tears and much laughter. A lot of wisdom and feeling what it's like to be a human being living this life. It doesn't go according to... Walt Disney. <laughs> it goes according to life. Thank you for listening. <laughs> now we have the interrogation. Questions and answers.
Very good, yeah, no, I did that. Hi, good. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is PJ. I'm standing in for NG uh, conducting and moderating the Q&A. So uh, for those who are not on the Bodhinyana Singapore Facebook page, please like it, and you can send your, your Facebook messages, uh, sorry, your questions via Facebook Messenger to the Bodhinyana uh, Singapore page, and then we will read the questions and uh, you know, float it up to Ajahn Brahm. So can please submit your questions to the Bodhinyana Singapore Facebook page. Do you have any questions yet? No, no questions. <laughs> okay, I'll ask the first question. Ajahn <laughs> Brahm, because somebody asked me this, he said, how, because many people in Singapore, many other countries, are so worried about what went wrong in the United States <laughs> with Mr. Trump. So how can we relate to that? And number one, when that first happened, I got a lot of emails from my disciples in the United States, can we come to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, look, it's something I always say, good, bad, who knows? You all know that story, I hope. If you don't know it, the book's on sale over there. All about sort of a king who lost his finger and thought the worst thing in the world had happened. And it turned out to have saved his life. So sometimes we don't know what might happen. I always like to look at the good side of things. If it does really turn, you know, pear-shaped, the United States, that if they do, you know, elect this person who turns out to be really, really bad, it's looking that way now, but who knows, give it a chance. But even if it does go very bad, what it will do, I think, in the United States, is to actually to encourage more people, like Obama said, to get involved in the political process you know, and actually to even turn out to vote. Because apparently the less than 50% of people in the United States did vote. And basically that's negligence. That's not really caring about the sort of person who would lead their country. So when more people get involved, more people care, more people take responsibility, you know, for their, uh, their leadership, then I think we'll be a much, much better class of leaders. And even something else which I've noticed, and this is from my knowledge of history, that in the Roman times, and the Roman Empire was one of the great empires the world has known, that they had a Senate, and every person who was standing for election to the Roman Senate would wear white clothes. And if they saw a person wearing white clothes in Rome, that was a sign they were a candidate for the election. Because the word candidate, it comes from the Latin word candid, meaning white. That's what candidate means, someone who wears white clothes. And the reason they also wear white clothes, like you see people in Buddhist temples wearing white clothes, is because it's also a sign of their purity. It's why even to these days, when you have a marriage, the woman always wears white. That's a sign of her purity. And the groom always wears black. <laughs> 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 no explanation needed. <laughs> but they wear white as a symbol of their purity because in Roman times, a senator would be elected on his past performance, especially on his virtue, on his goodness, on, or her morality. They were never elected on what they promised to do in the future. And in these days, unfortunately, in many so-called democracies, we elect our leaders on what they promised to do for us not what they have done for us in the past. And so the people who get elected are the ones who make the most outrageous promises. 
the one who outdo others in their lies and what they promise to do for us. And to this day I never blame a politician for breaking a promise because the situation, e economics, social situations, the, uh, what's happening between countries, it's always changing. You can't predict what's going to happen in the future. You know, how many economists predicted the global financial crisis? Very few of them. They should all be sacked, incompetent. They could never see it coming. So, you can't see the future, you can't predict it. Which is why can you promise about a future which you cannot predict? So I don't blame politicians for breaking promises, I blame them for making them in the first place. You should never make a promise of what you're supposed to do, because you don't know how things change. So, for goodness sake, how come, why don't we sort of have democracies where we elect people on their past performance in just the same way you'd elect a CEO of a company not for what they promised to do for the company but you look at their CV what have they done so far what their strengths are but somehow or other in politics we go a bit crazy we just elect people who promise us the most who have never delivered in the past now Donald Trump has never been in politics before, never had such uh, experience of even running a state or a small, even like a school board before. So that's one of the problems. He was elected on what he promised to do, not on what he had done before. So please let us never do that. Thanks very much, Ajahn. So uh, we'll answer the questions that came in in sequence. Um, there are quite a few questions now. Oh, good, now good, yeah. Got it, <laughs> so got it. I'll just read the first question. My mind has been locked in this argument with myself. If I have defended an accused in a state court, resulting in the accused being given a lighter sentence or acquitted, however he is guilty, have I been unfair to the victims and their families? Am I creating karma by doing this? Is this compassion to the accused appropriate in Buddhist perspective? Okay, I know the, the legal system in Singapore is the same as the legal system in Britain it, and also the same as the legal system, pretty much so in the United States, where it's adversary. We have a defense and a, a prosecution and they argue. And I much prefer you know, the European system, you know, like in Germany, where the job of the, uh, the judge is to ask the questions, not the prosecutor or not the defense but they want to find the truth much more than to actually have an argument between two people. And the more skilled lawyer in arguing is the one who actually wins the case. So I think a little bit of the system can be adjusted there, especially when the judge can intervene much more than they do in Singapore right now. But in the end, I mean, that is how it works here that you have got to see the worst, if you're the prosecutor, see the very, very, very worst interpretation of the facts. And if you're the defense, to see you know, every extenuating situation to get your client off the hook. But I'm not sure if you know that the last case of a person being hung in the UK was this situation of these two young men. One was 18, one was 17. And they had just done a robbery and a policeman chased them and they went up on top of a roof of a building and the policeman also went up there. So these two young men, 18 and 17, together with this policeman. And it was a 17-year-old who had a gun. And the policeman, like in the old British police, you know, said to this 17-year-old, uh, said, hand it over, son, don't do anything stupid. And the police weren't armed in those days. And the 18-year-old said to his young friend, give it to him. And the 17-year-old shot the policeman dead. And the whole trial just hinged on whether give it to him meant kill him or hand over the, the weapon. It can mean both things. And the, the prosecutor at that time was a man called Christmas Humphreys, a very well-known Buddhist in UK. 
who wrote many books, and his was one of the first books I wrote on Buddhism. And he managed to convince the jury that give it to him meant shoot him. So the 18-year-old was hung. The 17-year-old who, who uh, pulled the trigger was underage, went to jail for a few years and then was released. The 18-year-old was the last person to be executed in UK. And a Buddhist was a prosecutor who actually convinced the jury to convict him. And when he was interviewed, don't you feel remorse about that? He said, no, as a Buddhist, you know, I was hoping he might get off. I didn't want anyone to be killed. But this was my duty and job. I had to do this. I had to see the very worst interpretation as the defense had to see the very uh, lenient interpretation. But that's how our system works. So, and that meant you know, capital punishment. So he reconciled himself that you know, he had no intention to kill anybody. His intention, his karma, was just to do his best in the job he was given to be a prosecutor. Thank you, Rajan. Moving on to the next question. My partner would like to say the final word. To av avoid confrontation, I let my partner have the final word. But my preference is not even on my partner's list, even though I let my preference be known. I am sad and angry because I am being taken advantage of and not being appreciated. Please uh -huh. help. <coughs> okay, look, you should use psychology, Buddhist psychology. I've told this story before that when I first went to Perth, uh, I had one monk who was senior to me. So it wasn't quite the same of having a partner, but it was I was a junior monk, he was a senior monk, and he would never listen to me. He was the boss, he would make the decisions and do what he wanted to do. So he thought. Buddhist psychology is very sneaky. <laughs> so it's so simple. Whoever your partner is, if they're like that, always want to be in control and the boss, you just tell them something. I don't know who's who. Suppose you know, you're the girl and your partner is a guy. Probably the other way around, but to get out of trouble, your partner is the guy and you're the girl. Just say you want something. Say, I need a new dress. Just tell your partner, darling, I need a new dress. No, we can't afford it. You've got enough dresses. You can only wear one at a time. You've got three already. That's enough. Or whatever. Don't argue. Let them have the last word. As long as you've got one word in. Because what happens, psychologically, that stays in your subconscious. That's what I would do with this guy, this control freak monk who was my boss. I just tell him, can we build a kuti, a hut, over there? He said, no, stupid, ridiculous idea, it won't work. I let him have the hut last word. Two weeks later, this is important, make sure your partner's forgotten what you've said. <laughs> Two weeks later, I tell him again, he said, uh, I think we should build a hut, a kuti, on the hill over there. And again, he would say, stupid idea, wrong, won't work. And the number of times this works, and he never found out. And we'd be walking together, you know, a couple of weeks later, and he would say, I've just been thinking, why don't we build a hut over there? <laughs> and I'd always say, oh, what a wonderful idea of yours. I think that would work. <laughs> so whoever your partner is, let them have the last word, but you put in your word first. Reinforce it a week or two later when they think they've forgotten it. And then afterwards, whatever you said, that will become their idea. And they say, darling, I think you need a new dress. <laughs> oh, that's so kind and considerate of you. Thank you so much. You're such a wonderful partner. That's how it works. That's how it works with bosses as well. Bosses, you know, I really feel I need a, need a, a raise in my salary. No, we can't afford it. Difficult financial times. Oh, okay, never mind. And a couple of weeks later, try it again. <laughs> no, I can't afford it. Because what you're doing, you're planting the seed in their subconscious. <laughs> you know it's a good idea, 
And once that seed grows, then the important thing is, with a boss, with a partner who always wants the last word, it has to be their idea. At least that's what they think. You know whose idea it is. And who cares? You get your own way. And they never suspect. That's called Buddhist sneaky psychology. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually why I keep coming here. Angie said, oh, you should come here more often. I said, no, I can't. I'm too busy. No, you must come here more often. No, i just got too many other things to do. Now look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Arjun. I hope the person's partner is not here as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Moving on to the next question. Uh, question for Arjun Brahm. How do we extend this influence of not stigmatizing in institutions where labeling as dysfunctional is necessary for diagnosis and help? Ah, yes. So make sure when you do diagnose somebody that said, you know, that you know, like even, even like just being a bit weird and saying only part of your body has got a cancer. The rest hasn't got cancer. Just saying you have episodes. It looks like the episodes of schizophrenia, but right now you seem to be fine. You may have times when you feel depressed, but not all the time. Sometimes you feel wonderful. So just be more accurate. An example of that, I was told this by a mathematician, a pure mathematician. So what's the difference between a philosopher, an engineer, and a mathematician? And this, uh, this uh, was a philosopher, engineer, and mathematician were traveling in a train in Europe. And they saw a, a flock of sheep. Nearly all of those sheep were white, but one was black. So the, the engineer said, oh, yeah, in any flock of sheep, you know, in Europe, there were some black sheep. And the philosopher, no, it doesn't show that at all. It proves that in Europe, there's at least one sheep which is black. Just because, you know, this is a sample, we can't actually just to infer from one sample that whether there's so one black sheep, there's more black sheep in Europe. That's what a philosopher would say. And the mathematician would say, no, we can't even say that. Or we can say that in Europe there's one sheep, one half of which is black. Because that's all they could see, they could see the other half. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was the question anyway? I forgot that. <laughs> Just a good time to tell a story. <laughs> it was about the question was about how do we extend this influence of not sticking Ah, that's right, yeah. yeah. So that's like, you know, the mathematician is only, I've never seen a black sheep, I've only seen one sheep, which is, oh, some sheep, one half of which is black. You haven't got to do the other side yet to see the other side. So the same as like sometimes we, we uh, generalize too much. See some person who's you know, got a fever, they haven't got a fever tomorrow or this afternoon. How about saying that? Because that opens up an other side for a person. And what was it that, I keep on telling the story, Institute of Mental Health here in Singapore, over in Woodlands, where, the, I don't know if he's still here, the head of the schizophrenia unit, when I asked him how do you treat schizophrenia in Singapore, memorably he told me he doesn't treat schizophrenia in Singapore. A wonderful man, he's a Catholic, wonderful man. And I said, how do you treat schizophrenia? He said, I treat the other part of the person, which is not schizophrenic. And I thought that was an amazing, wise person. And he said, what's the result? He said, much better than conventional treatment. If you stigmatize, the person actually lives up to the, to the label. And they become more schizophrenic. So that's who they think they are. If ever you have a partner and you said, you lazy, selfish bum, then they become more lazy and more selfish. They live up to that label. You're stigmatizing them. What was it, that story, the two children at the checkout counter in the supermarket? At the same time, one child dropped a, jar, uh, a carton of milk while the other kid dropped a jar of honey, went splat over the floor. And the mother of the kid who dropped the carton of milk said, you stupid boy. 
and the mother of the kid who dropped the honey said that was the stupid thing you did. I'm sure you've experienced that before. You stupid husband. Instead of saying that was the stupid thing you did. Such a different way of, of talking. One is stigmatizing. You are stupid. The other one is just focusing on the act. That was a stupid act you did. You're not a stupid person. So please understand that because that changes the whole outcome. Never call your wife stupid. Never call your husband dumb. Just it was a dumb thing you did. But there's more to them than that. Thank you, Ajahn. Moving on to the next question. Um, just an uh, admin note that we probably have more questions than can be answered tonight. So um, unfortunately, we can't answer further questions uh, and maybe we don't have to send more questions in now. Uh, but moving yeah. on to the next question. <laughs> yeah, If there's someone in your life who behaves in a way in which you just don't understand why, example, they're negative, angry, or hateful, how do you accept it? Uh, no one is negative, hateful, or angry. That's stigmatizing them again. I'm sure there are some days, some hours, at least a minute, when they're not so angry, when they're not sort of... This is a wonderful way of overcoming sleeplessness by looking at your body part by part and relaxing it with kindness. Once the body is relaxed, it feels very pleasant. My body now hasn't felt as good all day. And then I go to another level of relaxation, relaxing my mind. Now, you may be relaxed and peaceful. You may be tense and agitated. So I'm going to ask you, don't shout it out loud or say it loud. Can you please give a number from one to 10 on how peaceful you are? One means really peaceful. 10 means very agitated. Give that a number from one to 10. All I'm really doing <coughs> is getting you to be aware of how peaceful you are or how agitated you are. I call that looking or being mindful of the peaceometer, like looking at a speedometer on a car to make sure you don't over go over the limit. You're looking at the peaceometer, how peaceful how, or how agitated you are inside. Now, see what you need to do to move that peaceometer closer and closer to deep peace. In the same way you relax your body, letting it be, not pushing or pulling your mind, not trying to get somewhere or achieve something, just being where you are. You find you get more and more peaceful. Can you feel that peace grow and deepen? When you are mindful of the peaceometer, you know how to develop more and more peace inside of you. One helpful way is doing a meditative mental exercise. Imagine you have been carrying two heavy shopping bags. You've been down Orchard Road. You're carrying these really heavy shopping bags. So long that your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. Imagine looking at, this is in your imagination. You imagine looking at a shopping bag in your left hand and on the outside are written the letters P-A-S. 
S D us. Within that shopping bag are all your memories, good and bad, of what's happened today, past week, the past year, as far back as you can remember. And you've been carrying those memories for such a long time. They're so heavy just like those bags would make your arms ache. Just carrying the past makes your mind weak, makes your brain tired. And then you imagine the shopping bag in your right hand, just like all shopping bags have the name of the department store or the shop where you bought the goods. But this shopping bag has the words F-U-T-U-R-E, future. Within that bag, you keep all of your plans, your worries, your concerns, your dreams and hopes as well, all in that shopping bag of the right hand. And that too is so heavy. You've been carrying around your plans and anxieties for such a long time without putting them down. But again, your mind is very tired. So imagining those two shopping bags representing your past and your future. You focus on the shopping bag in your left hand to begin with, the past. And you imagine slowly lowering that bag down and down and down until that shopping bag meets the ground. And when it does, you imagine all the weight disappearing so that you can move your left hand away from that shopping bag so that your left arm can hang loosely by your side, relaxing, recuperating. You put down the shopping bag of your past. Just put it down for a short while so you can relax and recuperate. And then you imagine the shopping bag in your right hand, your future, fears, anxiety, so heavy. It's made you so tired. So imagine lowering that down to the ground, slowly. And when it meets the ground, all the weight disappears, which allows you to move your right hand away from the handle of the future. So your right arm is by your side, resting and relaxing. You've let go of the future. And before you finish this exercise, you imagine those two bags. And you're standing on the floor. You're standing in the place between them. In this magic place we call the present. The place of freedom and peace and rest between the past and the future. No one, unfortunately, will take those bags away for you. When the meditation is finished, you can pick them up again. But right now, for the period of the meditation, don't pick them up. Leave them down there. You've let go of the past. You put down the future. And you deserve to rest in the present. And by taking a rest, just being peaceful in the present, it's an investment. When you come out of the meditation, you'll be more able, more strong, more energy to deal with the future and even the past. But right now you need to put those bags down and keep them down. No future, no past. Just now, this moment, just being. Not going anywhere or trying to change anything. Just contemplating what it's like to be. No judgment. Just being. Being content with this moment, happy to be here. No one is pushing you or judging you 
not asking you anything. There's no doing, no going, just being. Have a look at that peaceometer. How peaceful are you? How agitated? See if that needle of that dial, like the meters on your dashboard, see if you can see that meter showing a dial which is going down, down, down to more and more peace. No past, no future. Just the present moment. Just being here. Very often, naturally, people start to become aware of their breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. Just like watching the waves on the ocean when you're sitting on the beach. Just very gently, waves coming in, up the beach, and then receding away again. Water coming up and going back. Breath coming in going out, natural, gentle, just gives you something to watch instead of getting lost in all the thoughts, just being with the breath, no need to give anything a name, can you feel the breath, just noticing the breath going in, the breath going out. In the present moment, nothing to do, no past, no future. Keep your hand off those bags. And if you wish, you can imagine saying to yourself with every in breath, breathing in peace, beautiful, relaxing, health giving. Peace. And as you breathe out, breathe out, let go. Letting go of anything which is <laughs> out of compassion to me. <laughs> That's much better, thank you. Okay, very good. So now we can let the doors up, open. Yes, to all those latecomers. Very good. Here you can come in, boom, and the doors are open. Excellent, so please now relax. And if you want to just quickly go to the toilet, keep your seat. And all those who came in late, get the front seats. <laughs> Welcome everybody, you just missed out. Everybody here in the meditation was all enlightened. You'll have to wait to your next lifetime. <laughs> Very good. So please find a place to sit. There's, there's lots of people. Maybe you can squash up a bit in the front here. Can you squash up a bit? Because there's so many other people. It's nice and friendly. Make new friends. <laughs> what is it? Okay. So you get a nice seat. Now you can start talking now if you want to. I'd always be talking. Find a nice place to find a seat. Very good. Sitting on the floor is very good. You fit more people on the floor. I often thought of asking Singapore Airlines to take out all the seats 
and get people to sit on the floor, then they can get two levels, get twice as many people in the aircraft that they could sit on the floor. Good business plan. Very good. Yeah, you get closer to the power. <laughs> Very good. If I was something like Brad Pitt or someone famous, you'd like to get even closer. Very good. So very good. Especially those, those people with fat bottoms, they can actually sit on the floor because they don't need cushions. They've got their own cushion. <laughs> all fat bottom people. Can we invite them up to sit as well? Yes, you can sit up here if you wish. Okay, uh, could we invite all of you to just really move up uh, right yeah. to the end and squeeze in? They can't see me if you get too far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When I was a school teacher, I always used to know that the teacher's pets would sit in the front. And all the naughty people would sit in the front. And the other thing is that if you do suffer from wind, if you're subject to farting, please don't sit in the front. Otherwise, so many people will have to suffer what comes out of your backside. Please make sure you sit in the very, very, very back. That's if you've got indigestion, you pass wind. Is that compassion for people? Yeah. Very good. This is the Can we just uh, please close the gap Very there good. and move up? Thank you. Very good, yes. I always make sure that... And we're going to invite people now to come up to the stage and also take, s take up the space on the stage. Yeah. Now there's no one left now. So on the stage as well, you're welcome. There's no one left, they're all here. Anyway, latecomers. Very good. <laughs> we apologize that uh, we couldn't let you in when the meditation session was going on because there were a lot of people here enjoying the peace and, and silence. And if you were yeah. all coming in, then it would be, be very, very, very distracting. Noisy. So. We do apologize that you have to wait outside, but I hope you understand. And those of you who didn't have tickets, uh, please, please, for every event, we do have registration. So please book your tickets and have them ready so that it makes sense for people to reserve in advance. Because if we let people in without tickets, then it doesn't make sense for anyone to even register online. So we seek your understanding. The next event, Arjun Brahm will be here, will be at the end of the month. It's on 23rd. There are only 250 seats. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get this venue. We couldn't get many other venues. So that was the best that we could come up with at Rinse Multipurpose Hall at the uh, hospital itself. So the registration will open tomorrow, not today. <laughs> and you will see it on the Facebook posting. Depends on what time I wake up. <laughs> but it will be tomorrow. And, and if you don't uh, know about Ajahn Brahm's retreat yet, uh, please do take a flyer that's from the table or go to the Bodhiana Singapore page on Facebook. It's available there. The Ajahn Brahm's retreat will be in Phuket this year and mm. it's going to start on the 27th of May. You have a choice of the short retreat and the long retreat. And it's usually special with all of my retreats. I know it sometimes costs a lot of money, but we always give the possibility of asking for a refund. If you're not happy with the retreat, you can always ask for your money back. <laughs> and you will never get it back, but you can allow to ask. Ask from Ajahn Brahm, he won't have any money. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I can't give it to you, but you're allowed to ask. It's free to ask. You always say no, but it's free to ask. <laughs> okay, and since I have your attention, I'd like to uh, just highlight to you that there is a mental well-being seminar that will be held at the DBS uh, Financial Center. So this Ooh. is a secular charity that's got Ajahn Brahm's name on it, and there will be two speakers, Dr. Chan Kin Lung, 
will be speaking on depression and dementia. So please do come for the talk to find out more about depression and dementia because you can actually end up helping someone who may be suffering from one of the two. And although dementia due to Alzheimer's may not be treatable, there are two different kinds of dementia that are treatable. So be educated on that. And Dr. Peter Mack will be talking about building mental resilience. Buddhist Fellowship has organized a Taiwan uh, tour to uh, a few uh, famous uh, Taiwanese base monasteries. So if you're interested in June, uh, maybe you can look at the website or if you have a chance to get the flyer as well. Looks like you're all ready for the talk, right? Should we start early? Yeah. Like... 10 minutes early. Then they got more of you. This is Singapore. Singapore Airlines never leaves early. Yeah, they do. <laughs> on time. Sometimes ahead of schedule with all the passengers on board. Okay, uh, will the passengers who are just arriving please board up on stage? First class. <laughs> First class, upstage. You're being upgraded. <laughs> Compliments of Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> so please go ahead and, oh, don't fall. Very good. Uh, please go wow. to the other side so that uh, the latecomers can fill up on this side. So for those of you who are still not uh, entirely sure on how to meditate, you can come to uh, Brahm Center to learn mindfulness. And, they, and we actually teach uh, breathing techniques, loving kindness techniques, um, mindful movement, mindful walking. And we also invite you to join the mindful walk that will be on this Sunday. All the information is on, on this flyer. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, there is a new book launch today called The Perfectly Contented Book by Ajahn Brahm. And if you're a cat lover, perfect book for you. If you're not a cat lover, you will love cats after you read this book. <laughs> and uh, all time favorites, open your door of your heart. Uh, two bad breaks are all available. We do have some aprons as well to inspire you, especially when you're cooking. And when you're not cooking, you can wear it to do uh, housework. The proceeds go to uh, the monastery. And we have a few CDs left by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn on Wherever You Are, There You Are. It's an excellent uh, Dhamma talk, set of CDs of three, or four actually, that you can use it in your car. So those of you who drive, at least you're listening to something very inspiring. Okay, so I think uh, we're all ready to start. So I'd like to uh, introduce Ajahn Brahm to those who don't know Ajahn Brahm. There he is. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and why he's so popular, those of you who are here for the first time, is because Ajahn Brahm's uh, way of teaching the Dhamma is fresh, it's um, unconventional, uh, and he tells jokes, plus uh, he says bad what's... Bad jokes, bad jokes. Bad not, jokes, not good ones, yeah. but people still laugh, so they keep coming back. <laughs> and he also uses words like S-H-I-T. You, so, uh, you, <laughs> you mean shit? What yeah. word? Come on. <laughs> Come on, Angie, say it. Shit. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's bad influence. Okay, so uh, please welcome Ajahn Brown, who's going to be speaking on the topic when you don't get what you want in life. So please welcome Ajahn Brahm. Very good. I did not want to give a talk tonight, but I got what I don't want. <laughs> the whole of your life is getting what you don't want, but when things go wrong, that's when they get really interesting. So the more things which go wrong in my life, the more fun that I have. And I've noticed when I make mistakes and things go wrong, that is the very, very best part of my life. 
I think, I'm not sure if I told this story the last time I was here a month or two ago. If I did, then I'll have to attend that talk on depression and dementia, because I probably am suffering it for myself. But this was uh, when I was teaching a meditation retreat in Penang. And, I'm oh, sorry, Kuala Lumpur. And a couple of people came in to actually speak to me for interviews. And it was uh, a young woman and a young man. I thought she was about you know, 21, 22 years of age. And they wanted to talk about some things in their life and meditation. At the end of the five or ten minutes of talking to me, sort of, uh, the girl did all the talking. And I asked the girl, sort of, you know, is, who's that fellow sitting next to you? You know, is that your boyfriend? And she laughed and said, no, that's not my boyfriend. That's my father. <laughs> so I made big mistakes. Because I thought she was about 21, 22. She said she was only 16. But even though I made a mistake and my assessment went wrong, she was so happy that in a 16-year-old girl was like looked upon as being mature, 21, 22. She may be able to get into nightclubs and other places she's not supposed to go into. So she was very, very flattered, but not as flattered as her father was. You mean I look young enough to be his, her boyfriend? And even though it was a big mistake, they were so happy with me, that they went outside and five minutes later they came in with a $150 donation. That's why making mistakes is very profitable. <laughs> but on the donation envelope, they did write that this is to sponsor Ajahn Brahm going to the optometrist and getting his glasses checked. <laughs> but things do go wrong. You, or do they go wrong? All of this idea of things going wrong, I always say they don't go wrong in life, they go interesting. Because we always think that life shouldn't go interesting. It should all go according to plan. But I know in my life it hasn't gone according to plan. I became a monk a Buddhist monk to leave the world. Now look at me, sitting up here in front of a couple of hundred, how many people here tonight? Any idea? How many people are supposed to be here? 700 people. I never thought I'd become a monk like that. If I wanted to have been in front of 700 people, I'd have become a rock star. I got a guitar and started singing. But how, and it's absolutely true. If you want to come for that uh, talk in a couple of weeks' time, you have to book early. Because this one time I was teaching in a Medan in, Malay in uh, Indonesia, and they had to sell tickets only for like, you know, like a 50 cents each, just to be able to limit the crowd. Not to make any money, but uh, my tickets sold out in, what was it, about one hour or two hours when it went online. At the same time, Lady Gaga was performing in Jakarta. Her tickets took about eight hours to sell. <laughs> so it's very clear that I'm much more popular than Lady Gaga. <laughs> what on earth is happening in my life? This is totally not going according to plan. I just wanted to be a nice, simple monk. Spend all my time meditating. And that's probably what I like to do. I like to tell bad jokes. The reason I tell bad jokes, you may not know this, is I tell bad jokes on purpose. The reason is I want to offend people and upset people so much they can't stand my bad jokes anymore. They all go home. So I don't need to give any talks anymore. I can have a nice, peaceful, easy life. But what happens? I tell one bad joke and they ask for another one. <laughs> so I told this joke to somebody recently. You've heard it in Perth because it's very topical, Donald Trump. <laughs> now that's not the joke, I haven't told the joke yet. <laughs> I'm not sure if any of you heard the news, 
an assassination attempt against Donald Trump. You haven't heard that news? There's in one of his meetings, someone pulled a gun and pointed the gun at Donald Trump. And one of his bodyguards shouted out, Donald, duck! <laughs> <laughs> and at that, the gunman burst out laughing so they could arrest him. <laughs> That's a stupid joke. I don't want you to laugh, I want you to boo so I don't have to come back again. But anyway, <laughs> life never goes according to plan. So one of my little sayings, and I actually live by this, I said instead of planning things, try not to plan and just see what happens. Because I have noticed, I have noticed if I don't plan what I'm going to do, you know, things will usually go wrong. I miss appointments, miss flights, or whatever. If you don't plan, things go wrong. If you do plan, they go wrong anyway. <laughs> Either way it goes wrong, so why not enjoy it before it goes wrong? That's, <laughs> that's the meaning of <laughs> my life. Don't plan so much. The more you plan, the more chance there is that things go wrong which means not according to my plan. And the more you plan, the more you're going to have problems in life, the more things are going to go wrong, and you get frustrated. Why? Because it does not go according to plan. Nothing ever does. So, I encourage you to live like me. Just see what happens. It doesn't matter how things turn out. There's always something you can do with it. This is just a basic, this is a bit of Buddhism now. Actually, I'm a Buddhist monk, so I suppose I should talk some Buddhism every now and again. <laughs> this is a law of karma. Right? Karma gives you the ingredients which you have to work with in life. But the most important part is what you do with what happens to you. How you make it work. And the usual simile, which is you can actually remember, there's two people baking a cake. And the first person has the very worst ingredients. They've got white flour. White flour, which has been so refined and processed, there's hardly any, anything left. Just chemicals. And the white flour has been in the, the kitchen for such a long time, it's gone moldy. They have to pick out the green bits of the chemically enhanced white flour, first of all. And instead of something nice, they've got cholesterol-enhanced margarine. <laughs> uh, diabetically amplified sugar. <laughs> and they've got fruit fruit which is so hard the Singapore military could use it as bullets to fight their enemies. The very worst ingredients they have to bake their cake. And the second person has got the very best ingredients to bake a cake with. They have organically grown whole wheat, full grain flour from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> The very best, without any genetically modified crops within a thousand miles. And they have this, uh, what's it, uh, canola oil. It's supposed to be cholesterol free. And they've got beautiful honey. And lastly, they've got beautiful fruit from the gardens of Singapore. Fresh, the very best ingredients. Now, the two people, one with the worst ingredients, one with the best ingredients, who bakes the best cake? I read an article that uh, I made up this story years ago. But there was one of these celebrity, celebrity chefs. I forget who it was, Jamie Oliver or something. And they gave him a, a test, a competition, to go in Singapore to one of the hawker stalls and just same 
uh, to, for him to cook something up. Sickness, ill health, troubles, problems in your life, worries, anything negative. Just allow that to go out with every outbreath. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go. Breathing in peace and imagine peace. Whatever you feel peace to be, whether it's peaceful in silence like a forest or a mountain. Imagine peace in your body, health, energy, and peace in your mind. Breathing in peace. Whatever you wish to let go of, maybe sickness, maybe bad memories, whatever you wish to let go of, let it go with every outbreath. Breathing in peace. Breathing out, let go. Breathing in energy. Breathing out. Breathing in health, breathing out sickness. But please, whatever you choose, repeat it many times. I'm going to do breathing in peace, breathe out, let go. Breathe, breathe out, let go. Notice your peaceometer. How peaceful are you getting? What does peace feel like? When you know peace, not as a theory, but as an experience, you will value it. The most important thing in your life, peace. And as you enjoy that peace, it will grow and grow become solid, breathing in peace, breathe out, let go. Feel the peace grow. If you let go of all those problems and thoughts, past and future, let it go for this period of time. You don't need to think about it now. You're strengthening your mind and your brain so you can get answers afterwards, but not now. See if you can feel as much stillness as you possibly can. Your mind is like a lake. If there's thoughts on the surface of that lake, the image of the moon and stars cannot be seen. But if the lake is perfectly still, like a mirror, like glass, then a perfect image of the moon and the stars in the heaven above can be seen. When you are still and peaceful, that is when you see things as they truly are. That's where you solve the problems. Breathing in peace. 
Breathing in peace, breathe out, let go. Could you imagine your mind, your inner world, like a gu guitar string? If the string of guitar is very tight, it makes a high-pitched sound. As you loosen both ends, the guitar string makes a lower pitch noise. And so if the guitar string is totally loose, it makes no noise at all. The guitar string is like your mind. When it's pulled and stressed and tight, it makes many thoughts. When your mind is loose and relaxed, hardly any thoughts at all. Like a loose guitar string makes no sound. I will now be silent for five minutes to let you meditate without me guiding you. And after those five minutes, I'll let you know when the meditation is over. Be quiet. Don't move for five minutes.
Okay, how do you feel now? How peaceful are you? How relaxed? This is what meditation is like. And if you have a guided meditation, which you can get online, it makes life so much easier. So now please open your eyes and smile for any minute. Don't forget the smile. Remember, I've got to look at you. Down. Shut up. <laughs> and do nothing. So easy. So, so the best thing to do, first of all, is to close your eyes. So you don't have to see anybody at all. Just like going deep inside, inside your body and mind, like coming home. And inside yourself, this body and mind, please be kind. This person called you, oh, you've lived with her or him for such a long time. So now's the opportunity just to make peace and be kind and be friendly towards yourself. So with your eyes closed, you can imagine looking at yourself in a mirror and smiling. This little being who you've known for such a long time, being through so much together, it's a lot of happiness and fun and laughter, but also a lot of tears and pain. Now's the time to smile and say, I care for you, me. I really do love you. I wish you the very best. I may not be perfect, but I'm good enough. And you can imagine in your meditation all the trees in the forest and the ones which are the most crooked and bent and scarred those ones are the most beautiful trees in the forest. And that's you. Crooked, damaged by life. The most beautiful trees in the forest. So you start the meditation by making peace with yourself and being kind with yourself and appreciating yourself. So just appreciating, appreciating yourself as you are. So this meditation is not to improve, not to improve yourself, but <laughs> not to improve yourself, but to make peace with yourself as you are. So we, we start by making peace with our body, running around all day. How does your body feel? How are your legs? Can you make your legs more comfortable? So ask your legs, hey down there legs, can I make you more comfortable? How are you? Strange thing, if you ask a question, say of your legs, do you need to be moved? Then you get an answer. It is a skillful way of arousing mindfulness of that part of the body. Ask a question. Then you ask your bottom, bottom, do you need to be moved? If you want to fidget, now is the best time to fidget at the beginning of a meditation. Then ask your back, back, how you, do you want to move? And if you want to adjust your back, please again do so. Your hands, you can put your hands wherever you want, but ask them, are they comfortable? This is arousing mindfulness, and the mindfulness, once you're aware of your body.
once you are aware of your body, that's mindfulness. It allows you to have feedback to understand how your body feels. And you can just put it in a more comfortable position. And then once the, the arms are comfortable, just relax your shoulders. Can you be aware of your shoulders? How are they feeling right now? Are they tight or are they loose? See if you can learn how to loosen those shoulders. So they're really calm and at ease, comfortable. And lastly, your head. Is it well balanced on top of the neck? You can move it to the left, move it to the right, move it forward, move it back. Make sure it doesn't fall off though. If it does, put it back on until your head is as comfortable as you can make it. This is awareness of your posture and moving that posture to make it as comfortable as you possibly can. Mm. <coughs> and once, the, once the posture is adjusted, then just look at your body just as one thing not as parts. Is your body comfortable now? Now the next part of the meditation is a deeper relaxation. So I'm going to ask you, can you choose one part of your body, just one part, which is uncomfortable or even painful, which is irritating or aching, just one part of the body and see if you can zoom in on that one part. Focus on it. So just like Google Maps, you can zoom in or Google Earth and everything outside just fades away, falls off the screen as you focus in on an irritating or painful part of the body. And once you have an awareness of those feelings, you will notice that they change, they get better, they get worse. All according to the way your mind looks at it. See if you can experiment with letting that feeling be, being kind to it, embracing it, being with it. All those very gentle, calm, ways of looking to an irritating feeling. Your awareness can give you feedback. The irritation or pain gets less. Less intense, less painful, less irritating. You can use that with a, a running nose with a cold or with a, an irritating throat which wants to cough or with an ache in the tummy or anywhere. Aware, and then learning how to relax it. Not by moving, but by using your attitudes of mind. Giving that pain kindness. Giving that irritation letting be. It's like a rubber band which has been stretched tight. That's an irritation or pain. Stress. And you imagine noticing both ends of that rubber band and loosening the tension, letting it go until the rubber band gets loose, not stretched, not tense at ease. You've taken the stress off the rubber band. At the same time, you use that on your body. Taking away the pressure. Taking away all the pulling and pushing. Until that part of the body relaxes to the max. And the pain, the irritation, eases. This combination of mindfulness and kindness 
what I call kind fullness can relax any part of the body at will. And your body starts to feel relaxed. No tightness, no tension anywhere. Feels really good. And this helps you develop and understand what we call mindfulness. And always use it together with kindness or letting things be. Not controlling, but just accepting. Then you find your body relax very deeply. Feel, be aware of the body relaxing. It's a very, very pleasant feeling. And once you can recognize that feeling of bodily relaxation, you know how to overcome physical stress in your daily life. You know how to look at your body with your eyes closed. Be mindful, be kind, and relax everything. Being aware of any tightness or tension in the body and letting it be. If you need to go to sleep at night and you have insomnia, 